Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. My name is Kevin Butcher. I've been attending the church with my lovely wife, Abby, and our three kids for almost a year now. Um, David asked me to read this morning's scripture. Please bear with me. American is my second language. So, um, let's uh, please stand for the word of God. I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. So I decided to compare wisdom with foolishness and madness, for who can do this better than I, the king? I thought wisdom is better than foolishness, just as light is better than darkness. For the wise men can see where they are going, but fools walk in the dark. Yet I saw that the wise and the foolish share the same fate. Both will die. So I said to myself, since I will end up the same as the fool, What's the value of all my wisdom? This is all so meaningless. For the wise and the foolish both die. The wise will not be remembered any longer than the fool. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. So I came to hate life because everything done here under the sun is so troubling. Everything is meaningless, like chasing the wind. I came to hate all my hard work here on earth, for I must leave to others everything I have earned. And who can tell whether my successes will be wise or foolish? Yet they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. So I gave up in despair, questioning the value of all my hard work in this world. Some people work wisely with knowledge and skill, then must leave the fruit of their efforts to someone who hasn't worked for it. This too is meaningless, a great tragedy. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. It is all meaningless. So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him? God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to those who please him. But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. This, too, is meaningless, like chasing the wind. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, that last part was new, so we're going to try it again, okay? So, and, and I know it's new, so you weren't ready for it. But after everyone reads, after someone reads, they're going to say, this is the word of the Lord, and you're going to say, thanks be to God. God. That'll tell us that we're done. All right, Ecclesiastes 2, 11, or 1 through 26, the entire chapter is what we're going to tackle today. Very uplifting, amen? I mean, very encouraging, Koheleth, the teacher is. I I, I mean, the things that he's talking about, right, right at the very beginning, Right? He says, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. And what's that word meaningless? Hevel. 
So here's kind of what happens today. This week's sermon is, is a tag on, it's part two of Jake's sermon from last week. Because last week, Kohelet, the teacher, says, look, I'm going to try wisdom. Wisdom is a, is a thing we get from God. Wisdom is the application of intelligence, right? You can be smart and not be very wise, right? And you can be wise and actually not be all that smart. They're, they're two, they're intertwined, but they don't necessarily go together. But last week, Kohelet said, look, the teacher said, look, I, I tried wisdom, but what was the result? It, it's, it's not hard. What was the result? Hevel. I found out that it's meaningless. So today, the teacher kicks into another gear. He's decided he's going to try something else. He says, let's try what? Let's try pleasure. Let's give it a shot. Let's look for the good things in life. Now, there's something, there's a philosophy we can get behind in America. Amen? I mean, if there's any philosophy we can say that that's ours, then this is one we can get behind. Would you agree? Let's go for the good things in life. The ones with the most toys wins. So the teachers, in fact, what the teacher says is, I'm going to try an experiment. We're going to, we're going to do a little experiment in life. And he kind of uses the scientific method. Anyone, everyone know what the scientific method is? Yeah. What's the scientific method? Yeah, you start with a hypothesis, and then what do you do? You test it. You do an experiment, and then what do you do? Yeah, you look at your observations. What are the results? And off of that, you draw a new conclusion. That is exactly, and as we walk through this passage today, you're going to see this is exactly what the teacher, what Koheleth does. So where do we start? Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, I got that out of order. You're right. We start with the hypothesis. His hypothesis is very simple. We can find meaning and purpose in life if we try hard enough. By the way, this is America's motto. Work hard and all good things will come to you, right? There are books written by American authors that actually talk about this very thing. Your meaning, your purpose in life is by working hard, living the good life, spending money on things that will bring you joy and happiness and pleasure, and that's the best we can do. So Solomon says, let's give it a shot. Let's try. And we find the experiment in the first 11 verses. So I know Kevin read it, but we're going to read it again. He said, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. <laughs> and while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. What does that mean? While still seeking, while speak, seeking foolishness, while, what, while still seeking wisdom, I clung at foolishness. What does that mean? Was he drunk? Yeah, actually, most theologians, most, uh, if you look into the words, what he's saying is, is I didn't go that far. I didn't go to drunk. He so said, I didn't use wine for that part. That's the clutching to wisdom part, right? He, he got right up to the line. He flirted with foolishness, but he didn't go too far. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during this brief life in the world. The teacher is saying, what is, what is the most pleasure many of us ever experience in this life? I know that for some of you, this is, gonna, this is striking way too close to home. It's coming home from a hard day's work and having a glass of wine and saying, Phew. and the teacher is saying, for some of us, that's as good as it gets. What we should say to that is, uh-oh, is that as good as it gets? So he's not done. So he said, I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. Anyone ever gone to the Parade of Homes? 
and seen those beautiful homes and thought, who lives here? Who buys these homes? I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. For those of us who live in Colorado, reservoirs where people who have water store it. He says, I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. Which again, if this is Solomon, who is that? His dad, King David. He said, I collected great sums of silver and gold. Remember, Jake talked about that last week. How much in modern terms was Solomon worth? Two trillion dollars. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. Has he left anything off? What are the things he's doing? Yeah, he's, he's doing every... This is the American dream. King Solomon, thousands of years ago, is trying to live his best life. And he has the means and resources and power to do it all. He's building buildings and vineyards and herds and flocks. And he has servants and slaves. He, people do everything at his bidding. I mean, he's got concubines. I know your wife's sitting next to you. You're not allowed to say anything. Is that the American dream? I mean, if there was rock and roll, what is Solomon's theory? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. He said, I denied myself no pleasure. I did it all. I tried everything this life has to offer. Verse 9, so I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. Now, some of you are like, now it's about time. It's about time somebody said it. It feels good to work. Right? Put your nose to the grindstone and do some hard work. We can, we can find pleasure in that. But as I looked at everything I worked so hard to accomplish, see, before I read the last, the last part of this, Again, has, has Solomon left anything out? Sports. Sports. That's right. Where can we put that in there? I had everything a man could desire. There we go. We'll plug that one in there, right? He lived the good life. Can you imagine living this kind of life? I mean, who on earth today might live this kind of life? Bezos. Bezos. Maybe Elon Musk, right? Again, the guys with the means and the power and the time to do anything that their heart desires. I mean, did you hear about Bezos' yacht? He built the largest yacht in the world, and he built it, it's like in Denmark or something, and they built it on this side of a bridge, and he was going to pay to have the bridge dismantled so they could get his, his yacht through. And the town said, no, you're not. And they said, if you do, we will line up and aid your yacht. So they came up with plan B. They found another way around it. Yeah, they lowered the ocean. That's the kind of life that Solomon lived. He lived your dream and my dream. Can we just be honest about that? I mean, don't we at some point think, if I just had enough money, enough resources, enough time all of my problems would go away. How many of you have ever thought that? I have. And I know we say, yeah, money doesn't solve everything, but if you're like me, you think, I'd like to give it a shot. <laughs> I, I think I might be, a, everyone else has messed it up, but I could probably do it. Well, Solomon says, even with all my wisdom and hard work, what was his, the end result? Hevel. It's Hevel. He says it's meaningless. It's pointless. It didn't work the way I thought it was going to work. In fact, not only is it heavily, he says it's like chasing the wind. Anyone ever tried to chase the wind? 
Give it a shot this afternoon. We live in Elbert County, Douglas County, so there's going to be some wind. Have you ever tried to chase the wind? Can you imagine trying to chase the wind? What would happen? Yeah, what are you going to get by chasing the wind? Yeah, tired. That's it. You're going to get worn out. You're never going to catch it. He says, there was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Listen to that sentence. There was nothing worthwhile anywhere. So what was the hypothesis? Let's go back to that. We can find meaning and purpose in life if we try hard enough. So what did Solomon do? He tried hard. He tried everything. And he had no excuses. He had all the money he needed, all the time in the world. And he had everything. He denied himself nothing. And he comes to the end and he makes some observations. Observation number one is that it's all hevel. It's like chasing the wind. It's pointless. Now, again, if you're like me, I, I be, maybe Solomon didn't really know anything. Maybe he's looking at this life and coming to the wrong conclusion. But you know what? If we look at the life of people who've lived this good life, even in more modern days, what do we see over and over again? A lot of sadness, depression, suicide. Hey. Somebody give me just one example. Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Bourdain. Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain is a guy who traveled the world. If that's your dream, this is a guy who lived that life. Michael Jackson had everything. He had fame. He had money. He had an amusement park at his house. Everything he wanted, he could have quite literally. Robin Williams made people laugh. What is wrong? These guys lived their good life. They came to this conclusion. It's all hevel. It's it's meaningless. Now, I know you're thinking, man, this this is depressing. Yeah, it's going to get worse. Because here's the second observation. Death is the great equalizer. Listen to what he says, starting verse 12. So I decided to compare wisdom with foolishness and madness. For who can do this better than I, the king? I thought wisdom is better than foolishness, just as light is better than darkness. Would we all agree with that hypothesis again? Here's a mini experiment inside of the great experiment. Better to be wise or stupid? Wise. Which is better, light or darkness? Light. It says, for the wise can see where they're going, but fools walk in the dark. Yet I saw that the wise and the foolish foolish share the same fate. What's their fate? Both die. (laughs) Very uplifting. So I said to myself, since I will end up the same as the fool, what's the value of all my wisdom? This is all so meaningless. For the wise and foolish both die. The wise will not be remembered any longer than the fool. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. You know what's even worse? Sometimes those who we thought were wise, are, we find out later that they weren't all that wise. They weren't all that good. People we thought were great men and women in the past. We dig a little deeper and we find out that, I mean, we've got a term for that today, by the way. What are we doing with all of our great historical figures? We're canceling them. We're taking down the statues. And we can argue about whether we should or should not do that. The point is, it happens. And that's exactly what Solomon is saying. We look at Solomon, the wisest guy in the world, and what happened in his life. When you evaluated his life, at the very end, what what do we discover about Solomon? The wisest, richest man who ever lived. Yeah, he worshiped false gods. He was led astray. He worshipped other gods. He had all kinds of wives, which it's hard for me to listen to one. (laughs) It's just the truth. He's trying to listen to thousands, and they led him astray. God told him, don't do that, and he did that because he's living his best life. He said, no one's going to tell me what I can and what I cannot do, right? Right? And when we look back on his life, it's not that great. At the end of his life, he's, he's miserable. And, and Jake brought this up last week. What happened to this great empire, this great kingdom that he created? 
Within four years, it split, and it never recovered. Because death is the great equalizer. So I came, listen to verse 17. So I came to hate life because everything done here under the sun is troubling. Everything is meaningless, like chasing the wind. By the way, have you ever been there? I just, I just hate life. When does it get any better? You ever thought that? You ever thought, is this as good as it gets? You ever been in the worst of the worst and thought, this is, it's not worth it? It's kind of what Solomon is saying, right? Okay, one more observation. And this is going to make us all sad. Are you ready? You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. How much money does Solomon, he had $2 trillion. How much money does he have right now? <laughs> Zero. Verse 18, I came to hate all my hard work here on earth, for I must leave, er, uh, leave to others everything I have earned. And who can tell whether my successors will be wise or foolish? That they will control everything I have gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. Now, here he's not even getting to the you can't take it with you part. What's he saying? Not only can you not take it with you, you got to leave it to people you don't trust. They didn't even earn it. I'm, I'm not saying this. Solomon is saying, I'm convinced I'm going to leave this to my children. My children are going to squander it. Has that ever happened in the history of mankind? Yes. You heard about the story of the old grouchy guy, billionaire, who uh, they get to the reading of the will. And he, he decides he's going to leave his wife. He tells his wife, I want all my money. I want it all to go with me. You get nothing. I want you to bury me with every penny I ever earned. You heard this story? And so at his funeral, she walks up to the casket, writes a check, throws it in. <laughs> you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. And the people you're going to leave it to, who knows what they're going to do with it? So I gave up in despair, questioning the value of all my hard work in this world. Some people work wisely with knowledge and skill, then must leave the fruit of their labors to someone who hasn't worked for it. This too is meaningless, a great tragedy. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? The teacher's asking this question again. What do you get for all of your hard work and all of your anxiety? Your days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. It is all meaningless. Anyone ever been there? Anyone ever been woken up at night and you're, you just can't shut your mind off? There's so much stress and anxiety and pressure. Anyone ever had an argument with somebody without the person even being there? <laughs> Anyone ever had 70,000 arguments with somebody and they're not even there? And then you have the argument with the person and it's never one of the things you imagined? Isn't it crazy? He's saying, look, oh, we work hard and we have all this struggle and stress and pain and grief. Do we agree with his observations and conclusions? He says, it's all so meaningless. All right. So the, the hypothesis was, if you work hard enough, you can achieve the things. You can have meaning and purpose in your life. And so the teacher lives that life. And what's the end result? What does he observe? What's the conclusion? It's, it's, you can't take it with you. you it, and death is going to take you no matter what, right? Even if you achieve something, you're going to die. Isn't that great news? Here's the ultimate conclusion, though. Here's some good news. God is the key to living the good life. You can't finish the story. Let's finish it. Pick it in verse 24. So I decided there's nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Now, what's the problem with that sentence? Isn't that counter to everything that he just said? So, so my conclusion was, enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in your work. But he tried to do all those things and none of them worked. Yes, yeah, because he's missing a key. He says, then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him? God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to those who please him. 
But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. But then look at the last sentence. This too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. You just want to kind of throw your hands up in the air and go, what? So, hmm. Because we want an answer, right? right? And what does the teacher tell us is the answer? He says it three times over the course of this chapter. What does he say? It's all hevel. It's like chasing the wind. It's all hevel. The good stuff is hevel. The bad stuff, hevel. All of it is hevel. And it's important that we begin to grasp that. Because if you're chasing after pleasure, if you're chasing after the good life, if you're chasing even after knowledge or wisdom, if you're chasing after anything in life, it's like chasing the wind, which brings us to an important question. Yeah, what are you chasing after anyway? And I want you to take a second and think about that. What are you chasing after? And I want to give you some boundaries for answering this question. Number one, I want you to think about where you spend most of your time and energy. Where do you spend most of your time and energy? Because that's what you're chasing after. And is it accomplishing what you're hoping it's going to accomplish? What are you chasing after? Can we talk, can I just be real for a second? I mean, what, what Solomon's really talking about here is you, you have to make the important things the important things, right? You know, we've got a sign on the back here again that says, now entering the 167. Right? This is 168 hours in a week. How do you spend most of those hours? What are most of us going to do this afternoon? Take a nap. <laughs> Take a nap. We're going to eat, right? Anything else? Oh, we're going to work in the yard? Okay. Got some honeydews, I see. He's shaking his head. So that one on my list, right? Watch TV. Grandkids. Grandkids. What do all those things have in common? It's either working hard or... Playing hard. Or what do we do for five days out of the week? We work hard. Why do we work hard? So that we can play hard. Right? We work hard so we can play hard. Hard work and pleasure. What are our lives revolving around? Hard work and pleasure. Uh, what are the things we just talked about? Hard work and pleasure. By the way, if you examine your life, how's it going? I mean, they just raised the mortgage rates. Doesn't that make you happy? Read the political news lately? I mean, it's a good thing we got things figured out because it is going swimmingly in the world. Right? What are we chasing after? And is it accomplishing the things that you want? What, is, what does the teacher tell us? You can look at this list. Are you chasing after wisdom, the pleasures of life, hard work and achievement? And, and he says, eh, those things don't work. It doesn't work. So what do we do with this? By, by the way, it, it tell us. Yeah, th that might be cheating. But by the way, is hard work bad? No. no. Is pleasure bad? No. no. Let, let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, Flirt on the edge of crude for a second to prove a point, okay? Psalm says, look, I hired wonderful singers, men and women. I had beautiful concubines. I had everything that a man could desire. What is he talking about there? Sex. Sexual pleasure. Is sex bad? No. no. Trust me, if you tried it, you would know the answer to this question, right? <laughs> Am I wrong? No. Right? Who gave it to us? God did. But can we pervert it? Can we turn it into something that isn't good? 
that isn't holy, that isn't righteous? Absolutely we can. And so part of what the teacher is saying is when we try and do it in our own effort, in our own strength, we're going to mess it up. By the way, anyone in the room ever messed anything good up? I love, by the way, I love watching you get online, you watch these, like you get a professional baker who makes this thing and then someone else tries to make the thing, right? And it's a hard fail. That's my life. I'm an expert on just about anything when I'm watching YouTube. Uh, man, I just watched this YouTube video. I can go fix my car. No, I can't. We just fixed the car yesterday, tried to drive it away, and guess what was all over my driveway? Oil. Just spewing out of the engine. Good thing I saved that 40 bucks, right? <laughs> Find me later to ask the whole story. I'll give you the whole story. <laughs> we think we've got it all figured out, but it turns out at the end of our life, we don't. So what's the right answer? The right answer, I mean, I'm going to just jump right to the end. How's this sound? Is to chase after God. Be content with what God provides. Do everything for his glory and seek his kingdom first and only. Now, by the way, there are biblical passages that give, give us proof for all of that. That's the stuff I'm skipping over a little bit. Should we be content with what God provides us? Yes. 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 You know, Philippians 4.13. How many of you know the Philippians 4.13 passage? Right? Uh, I'm going to ruin it for you. And what is Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Right? And we read that and what do we hear? I can do all those things through Christ who gives me strength. But if you go back one verse, do you know what he's actually talking about? Being content. He says, I've learned to be content in every situation, whether I have a bunch of stuff or I have nothing. He says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Well, that changes the tone, doesn't it? That's not, I'm not putting that on, I'm not tattooing that on me. Learn to be content. That's not nearly as exciting as I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Can you be content with the things that God has given you? Yes. You liars. <laughs> and I know you're lying because I, we all tell ourselves that lie. You can't do it on your own. You can do it with his help. Do everything you do for God's glory. Whether you're working or playing, whatever you're doing, exalt and glorify him. And seek his kingdom first. Listen, listen to this passage. So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything that you need. Do you believe that verse? Yes. No, you don't. <laughs> Do I believe that verse? I do here, but what I need to do is get it here. Because the question is, what am I working so hard for? Why am I worried? Why am I staying up at night? Why? You don't trust. Yeah, I don't trust that God's going to actually give me everything that I need. I'm just being honest. I just don't trust that he's really going to come through. Or here's the thing. Here, here's the game we play, right? I believe God's going to come through, but I'd like to have a plan B. <laughs> I want a safety net just in case. God's going to give me everything I need, but if I have a million dollars in the bank, then I don't have to worry about whether God gives me everything that I need. Can I go back for, and this isn't in the notes, so I'm, I'm going to wing it here for a second. Can we go back to the Israelites and their time in the desert? You remember God giving them everything that they needed? Did he say, I'll give you everything you need? How much did he say to take? Right? He gave them manna every morning. What did he say? Just today. Just take what you need for today, because then you're going to trust that God's going to give you what you need tomorrow. And what did they do? They did what we would do. 
the first time, what'd they do? They got a whole bunch. And they said, I'll save this for tomorrow. And, but tomorrow came, and what happened to that manna? It was rotten. Maggots. It was disgusting. Except for the day before Sabbath, then you could get two days worth, and it wouldn't go rotten. Because he didn't want you to work on that extra day. God gives you just enough. That you, you know, how many of you know, um, you know the past, that's the Old Testament, that doesn't count. Right? Jesus came so that we could um, do things better, so that we could hoard things. That's why Jesus came. <laughs> right? That's what he said. Store up for yourselves treasures here on earth. We're moth and rust, right? Isn't that what he said? Now, where did he say? Store them in heaven. Because he said, if you store them anywhere else, you can't take them with you and you're going to die. You know, believe me, look at the story in Luke of the rich man. He says, I got everything I need and I've stored it in barns. And God says, you fool. Tonight you're going to die. You don't get to take any of it with you. Right? Where was I going with that? Remember I was going on trail. Come back. I'm, get, I'm getting, coming back. Okay. So Jesus tells us how to pray, right? The Lord's Prayer. Anyone ever heard the Lord's Prayer? Anyone ever said the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Okay, that's all. You got the rest. Give us what? Today, the bread that we are going to need tomorrow and the next week. We've got to learn to depend on God for today and let him deal with tomorrow. In fact, he even said that. Tomorrow has enough worry and trouble of its own. Let tomorrow go. Tomorrow is never going to be here, by the way. Now, are we going to have pressures and worries in our life? Yeah, the question is, are you seeking his kingdom above everything else? And does your time tell you and your effort tell you that that's what you're doing? Now, I'm going to step on my own toes here for a second, and I'm going to get yours in the process. We have no problem spending time with Netflix, but all kinds of time problems spending time in God's Word and with Him. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it to life group this week, but I for sure am going to make it to the bar on Friday night. I'll make it to the concert. I'll make it to the game. One, one last hit, and then we're going to move on, okay? Would you all agree that we have a generation of kids who don't know God like a previous generation knew God? Do you know why that is? Because they're spending more time on the practice field than they are with God. And it's our fault. Because we've made that a priority. We've allowed that to be a priority. You say, Pastor, you don't understand the pressures. Yes, I do. But then don't wake up in 15 years and your kids are living a life apart from God and blame God for it. Are you seeking the kingdom of God above everything else? And are you living righteously and trusting him with all the rest? What did I leave out? That's it. Is there good news in all of this? Yes. Yeah, right? We've been going through Ecclesiastes and I'm going to tell you, Ecclesiastes continues to be depressing. It's a downer. But it's drawing us to a conclusion. It's trying to get us to understand. If we can learn from the teacher's mistakes, we don't have to make those same mistakes. But guess what we're going to do? We're going to make those same mistakes. And the teacher's going to stand over us and go, told you so. Told you it wouldn't work. You know how I know? Because I tried it. I tell my kids this all the time. You are an absolute moron as a teenager in, through your 20s. You're just, you're stupid. And you know how I know? I was stupid when I was 20, all the way through my teen years and into my 20s. I'm still flirting with it. But I got a little life experience under my belt, right? Young people, ask the people around you if the thing you're about to do is smart or not. Not because you're going to change your mind, but just so when you're done, you can see how right they were. Should I drive 80 miles an hour down a dirt road in the back roads of Castle Rock? What's the answer? No, no you should not. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Let's stand and pray. Father God, we thank you. First of all, we thank you for the pleasures that you do offer us in this life. 
And we know that what heaven really is, is all of that pleasure, all of our time and energy and focus, being able to focus on you and your kingdom, without sin, without the pressures of life weighing in on us, we get to get back to Eden. Father, we just got to confess, I have to confess, what I'm trying so hard in my life to do is get back to Eden. Get back to everything that, as it was. And so we try different things, but when I do it in my own power, Father, I just, I just mess it up. So I just ask for your power to help me to chase after you instead of chasing after the wind. To seek you above everything else in my life. And Father, I know right now I'm, I'm not going to succeed at that the way I want to. But I thank you for your grace, your forgiveness, and the fact that you never give up on us that you're always with us, always by our side, always encouraging us, always, always there to pick us up and help us. So Father, today I pray that we'll commit, even as we walk out these doors to have some fun, that we'll have that fun knowing, and we'll, we'll enjoy the food that we have, knowing that it came from you, that you're providing it. As we watch our kids in the bouncy castles to understand that that's, that is pure enjoyment that comes from you. But Father, let us chase after you and the things that truly matter in this world. In all God's people said, amen. amen. Let me send you off with this blessing from, from the book of Jude. There it is. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You're dismissed. Stack a chair. Remember, we're going to be outside, enjoying some time, hanging out with people you don't know, and get to know them. God bless you. Have a great week.